Biological information, the fine-tuned genetic code. We've been discussing the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, edited by a number of um, intelligent design people and Bruce Gordon, who is more of a uh, self-organizational theorist, um, but who also feels that um, the standard evolutionary perspective is inadequate. Published by World Scientific Publishing Company just two, one, two years ago now, a little less than two years, and uh, was uh, the proceedings of a symposium held in uh, 2011, and the reason for the gap is because Springer Verlag contracted and then tried to back out, actually wound up backing out of the contract uh, to publish it. Uh, World, Publish World Scientific put it online so you can get this chapter and all the other chapters. Um, and, um, but they also published the book itself in print form. And um, I got me a copy, uh, more to support them than anything else. It's expensive. It's over $100. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the book is divided into general introduction and then information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Now, uh, we have moved on from the second major uh, section to the third major section, which is theoretical molecular biology. I'm skipping two chapters, as I did with part one. There are a couple of chapters that I felt mm, they're not worth a, a full presentation. Mm, and um, uh, not because they're wrong, but because they're, um, there isn't enough to grab to make it worth a, a full 30 plus minute presentation on them. Uh, this one is one of the better ones. It's called An Ode to the Code, Evidence for Fine-Tuning in the Standard Codon Table. It's uh, Jed McCosco and Amanda Smeltzer who are at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. And uh, um, the abstract starts out, the Standard Codon Table records the correlation observed in nature between the complete set of 64 trinucleotide codons and the 20 amino acids plus three nonsense, or stop, or termination signals. This table was called a frozen accident by Francis Crick, yet current evidence points to optimization that minim minimizes harmful effects of mutations and mistranslations while maximizing the coding of multiple messages into a single sequence. For example, a recent article with a running title, The Best of All Possible Codes, concluded that evidence is clear for the optimized nature of the uh, standard code on table, and another study found that difficult to encode secondary signals are minimized in the standard code on table. Additionally, the initiating amino acid methionine has been found to minimize the nascent peptides chain's barrier to exit the ribosome. It's easier to exit using the one that was chosen. Optimized again. Moreover, the symmetry in the standard code on table between fourfold synonymous and and less than fourfold synonymous codons has been explained in terms of minimizing mistranslation. Everything looks planned, but how do you get planned by just chance? Which is why the frozen accident kind of really doesn't, doesn't satisfy. Um, in this paper, the hypothesis that the finely tuned optimization of the standard codon table originates in external intelligence is compared to the hypothesis that its fine-tuning is due to the adaptive selection of earlier codes. It is concluded that in the absence of metaphysical biases against this hypothesis, external intelligence better explains the origin of the standard code on table. Additionally, this hypothesis prompts lines of inquiry that 50 years ago would have accelerated this discovery of the now known features of the SCT and that today can lead to new discoveries. Introduction. In 1976, Francis Crick and uh, co-authors wrote, the origin of protein synthesis is a notoriously difficult problem. 
Proteins are synthesized based on information contained in mRNA according to an easily represented map between RNA trinucleotides and protein building blocks. This map describes the flow of information from mRNA to protein in nearly every organism and is usually called the genetic code. Just to make it more fun, there are actually a few different codes. Here the map, figure one, is called the standard codon table. I'm going to show that in a minute. To distinguish it both from the physical machinery, which was shown in figure two, that enables this flow of information and from additional codes of secondary signals. These, these so-called subcodes are second layer codes and the coding machinery itself are integral parts of the true genetic code, that is the full code that starts with the genetic information in DNA and ends with the protein and RNA machines that keep the organism alive. So this is the core of that full code. And there's the figure one. Um, it may help you to imagine that these ones all go all the way across. Um, the blank spaces are not particularly useful. And there's another slide that will show uh, without them, but this gives you a pretty clear idea of the separation between the two kinds. One where the third one doesn't matter, it always gives you leucine if you have C and U. Um, and uh, one in which the final tail end does matter. Um, you will notice that there are some duplications that arginine can be done by CG or it can be done by CA and then either G or A. Serine the same way, leucine the same way. Isoleucine kind of surrounds methionine as a little bit of an island there. And finally, the stop codon. There are three different stop codons and they're not, in this arrangement, they're not all right next to each other. Um, and here's the machinery itself. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, in this um, chapter and therefore in this talk, we're not going to discuss the creation of the machinery. We're just going to be talking about the actual code that helps transform, you know, ha helps add a particular amino acid to a growing polypeptide chain. The evolutionary origin of the protein synthesis scheme shown in figure two is what Crick considered a difficult problem. There are two parts of this problem. First, how to generate the, coding, uh, the general coding scheme, that is figure two, originated. And second, how the specific correspondence between the trinucleotides and amino acids, that is the uh, standard coding table, uh, figure one, came about. These two parts are interrelated, but it is helpful at first to, to consider them separately. Theories of the origin of standard codon table. Currently, there are four theories that alone or in combination address the origin of the standard codon table. First, there's the frozen accident model, which takes its name from Crick's suggestion that the SCT was a frozen accident. Sort of like the QWERTY typewriter may or may not be the best, probably isn't the best in general nowadays, but when it was first started, it was the best of a number of different choices. And, and once people learned to use it, they just kept using it. That was uh, what he means by frozen accident. Uh, which, um, in other words, neither the mechanism that led to the general coding scheme, figure two, nor any other mechanism dictated the pattern in the standard coding uh, codon table. It was purely an accident. The standard codon table could have ended up with any arbitrary structure, thus the current structure does not reveal any information about a past mechanism. And coincidentally, we have no reason to expect that it should be an idealized or a, an optimized table. <coughs> and that's figure two again. The other three, figure, the other three theories that all assume that the standard codon table was not an accident, but was formed by a mechanism. By examining the nature of the standard codon table, one can learn about the mechanism that formed it. The first of these theories is the error minimization model. In this model, the SCT was formed by a mechanism that primarily 
minimize the negative impact of DNA mutations, of RNA mistranscriptions, and of protein chain mistranslations. All the kinds of errors that can happen in DNA to protein transcription and translation. Thus, the arrangement of amino acids in figure one is not accidental. For example, once a guanine base in the first codon position and an adenine base in the second position came to represent one of the negatively charged amino acids, and both negatively charged amino acids became encoded with the sequence GAN, where N is any base, such that a mutation in the third position would simply exchange one negatively charged amino acid, glutamic acid, perhaps, for aspartic acid, which differ only in the length of the chain by one CH2 group. And uh, here they are, right next to each other. Now, there's a problem with that. Arginine and lysine are a little bit further away than that. Um, the two negatively, or two positively charged amino acids. Um, and um, the asparagine and glutamine, which are, you know, closely related to aspartic and glutamic acids, seem to be further away from each other than you would expect. So it's not an ironclad one, but this is the one that they pick on, and it, and it probably does illustrate their point. Another theory proposes that the origin of the SCT is linked to or co-evolved with primordial amino acid biosynthesis. That is to say, the ones that are synthesized from the same starting amino acid all got related codes. Several of the 20 amino acids shown in figure one are synthesized in living cells starting from other amino acids. For example, the negatively charged amino acid aspartic acid is known to be a precursor for methionine, threonine, isoleucine, and lysine. These four amino acids are encoded by ANA and ANG codons, figure one, which some take as evidence in favor of this theory. And here's the example, uh, aspartic acid. And here, if you have G or A, you can get all four of those. Well, of course, what's isoleucine doing out here? I guess threonine captured a whole round. Interesting, arginine is here and here. So how did arginine get both? But, you know, it's, it's kind of maybe that way. The final theory depends on stereochemical interactions between amino acids and their respective trinucleotide codons. Uh, or anticodons. Or anticodons? Well, this model was popular immediately after the elucidation of the SCT since it postulated a single mechanism for the origin of the codon assignments. Each codon or anticodon had a physical affinity for its respective amino acid and not for other amino acids. And in fact, I got served with one of these, and I think I presented it here. Um, uh, pointing out that the statistics weren't all that, that good. Totally independently, I have no idea of before or after, um, there's a comment in, in, uh, in 10 that suggests that uh, maybe this theory doesn't fit that well. Thus, had this theory proved true, the assignment shown in figure one would have been biochemically predestined by virtue of stereochemical interactions. As it is, the evidence is limited with respect to statistically significant interactions between the codons or anticodons and their respective amino acids. Of the 20... How, uh, how can this actually be true if the amino acid is at one end of the tRNA and the codon or anticodon is at the other end? You asked too many questions. <laughs> Of the 20 amino acids, only seven, phenylalanine, isoleucine, leucine, histidine, arginine, tyrosine, and tryptophan, show such interactions, and the preference for codon versus anticodon involvement appears random. Sometimes it matches what it should. Sometimes it matches the entire reverse. It's 50-50. Um, you know... This theory doesn't predict very much that actually works. And in fact, when you find the spots that actually congeal over this particular amino acid, 
you'll find that there are several different codes that could be interpreted the same way. But, you know, obviously whoever wrote 10 thinks that this is not so as a theory. Of the four theories, error minimization and amino acid biosynthesis are currently favored. Notice that the uh, physical attractions are gone. Uh, though some claim these mechanisms are minor influences compared to just frozen accident. It is important to remember that these four SCT origin theories do not explain the origin of the machinery. They're just explaining the code on table itself. Theories for the origin of the coding machinery are abundant and are generally viewed as extremely speculative. This is Eugene Koonin's paper. He says it doesn't make sense. They're just, it takes, the, the, the probabilities are just off the charts. Um, it's, that paper is worth a read. As such, this paper does not address these theories, but focuses on just the origin of the code and assignments themselves. So we're going to leave, how do you make the machinery for another day? In the next section, we present four studies that describe SCT features that are optimal and that are orthogonal. That is, the optimality of one would not necessarily lead to the optimality of others. For those of you who haven't seen orthogonal before, and we're going to see it a few times, orthogonal is right angle. So that, for example, if you're doing an XY, that the movement on the X scale has no relationship to the movement on the Y scale. And that if you're trying to optimize to a distance to a certain point, you can move the X without, without worrying about what the Y is doing. So they're, they're, they're unrelated to each other in terms of their effects. These features are, one, similar amino acids are coded by similar codons, thus minimizing the impact of errors. Two, the family non-family symmetry minimizes mistranslations while maximizing <coughs> tRNA usage efficiency. Three, the stop codons are related to commonly occurring amino acids in a way that optimizes second layer codes. And four, methionine is an optimal initiating amino acid due to its minimized energy for exiting the ribosome. First, orthogonally optimized features of the standard codon table. Pre previous studies have compared the optimality of the SCT to those of alternate codon tables in terms of how they mitigate genetic errors by ensuring that similar amino acids are coded with similar codons. One of these studies in 2000 by Freeland et al. determined the most optimized code div given different values of two parameters. The first parameter was the relative likelihood of transitions, that is, AG or thymine cytosine exchanges, which are pretty easy to do. You deaminate cytosine and suddenly you have a uracil, which will now, or, or th uh, if, you, if it's methylcytosine, it becomes thymine, um, which can now be uh, code with uh, guanine instead of adenine. That happens naturally. Um, and transversions, which is taking a pyrimidine and swapping it for a purine, which is a whole lot harder to do. The second parameter was the relative impact of mutation is modulated by the power to which the error equation is raised. For most of the intermediate values of these two parameters, the real SCT was the single most optimized code on table, the, quote, best of all possible codes, as this paper's running title suggested. Interestingly, this 100% optimization of the SCT was demonstrated within a restricted set of codon tables. The restricted set reflected the amino acid biosynthesis theory described above. Thus, this paper blended the two favored mechanisms for the origin of the SCT, error minimization and biosynthesis, and quantified a level of optimization that was near or at the global maximum. And they're not kidding. It actually says the best of all possible codes. Now, some of you may remember that phrase used in a slightly different context. 
best of all possible worlds. These, these people know their uh, history and philosophy. That's, of course, uh, uh, stolen from Leibniz, who, who uh, tried to explain the, uh, uh, the um, origin of evil by the best of all possible worlds. You, Freeland et al.'s landmark study tacitly assumes that an optimized code imparts to its owners a selectable advantage over organisms that have not as optimized codes. Recent work by uh, Geiler uh, Samarati et al. helps to answer the question, what, if selective effect, what selective effects would a more optimal code have? These authors compared the fitness of mutant yeast expressing a gratuitous protein that misfolded to varying extents. When the protein mostly misfolded, and was present at high levels, 47,000 copies out of about 40 million total protein molecules per cell, or 0.1%, more or less, the selective disadvantage was 3.2%. Ideally, a selectable disadvantage might be purged from a population when the disadvantage exceeds the inverse of the population size. Uh, notice this is, uh, this is highly optimistic given uh, some of our previous papers. It's ideally, uh, which in yeast is about 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the seventh, which is 0.00001% uh, when you invert it. The authors extrapolate from 47,000 copies linearly uh, to just one misfolded molecule per cell and predict a fitness dis disadvantage of uh, 0.000. 0.8%, that is to say, eight times higher than the selection threshold, the theoretical sele selection threshold. Thus, relative to the less optimal codes, any code that results in one less misfolded protein molecule per cell, or even per around eight cells, can produce a selective advantage. How many less misfolded molecules arise thanks to best of all possible codes, or one in a million code, is still an open question that awaits, uh, that awaits a direct experimental link between mistranslation rates and misfolding probability. While Freeland et al. reported on how the SCT minimizes the impact of errors, another study found an SCT feature that avoids errors in the first place. In 2001, Lim and Curran modeled the specificity of correct codon anticodon duplex formation in the middle of that machinery during translation. One of the propositions of their model is that for ribosomes to reject an incorrect duplex, the incorrect duplex must have at least one uncompensated hydrogen bond. This criterion for rejection is problematic when duplexes have a pair of pyrimidines, uracil, the RNA equivalent of T, or C, cytosine, in the wobble position that is the third position in the codon or the first position in the anticodon since they're running in opposite directions as is traditional. Pyrimidine bases are smaller than the GNA of purine bases and if they're in the wobble position they allow certain mismatches in the second position to form non-Watson Crick pairs thereby compensating their missing hydrogen bonds. These mismatches in the second position then fail to be properly re rejected and result in a mistranslation event. So if you have the wrong code, you can have this problem. This problem of failed rejection nicely explains why 32 codons in the SCT are in split boxes, and the other 32 are in family boxes, that is, the so-called family-non-family symmetry of the SCT code. And uh, we'll look at that again. Um, you'll notice, there it is, that there's the uh, there's the ones that all four code for the same pro, uh, amino acid, and there's one where you have the boxes split into different sizes. This explanation begins with the observation that the failed rejection problem can be solved by modifying an anticodon's pyrimidine in the wobble position such that it can no longer form a pyrimidine pair. If pyrimidines are modified in this way, then a single anticodon that could have recognized as four codons can now only recognize two codons. In other words, there will now need to be one TNR, tRNA for the third position pyrimidines, U and C, 
and another tRNA for the third position purines, A and G, and in some cases for only one purine. The choice of which codon boxes in the SCT should be split is thus predetermined by the same stereo stereochemistry that determines which mismatches in the second position fall prey to the failed rejection problem. The codons that are susceptible to failed rejections are those with 1, N1A2, 2, U or A1U2, and 3, U or A1G2. Uh, notice that U or A are the weaker of the two pairings. CG is a little bit tighter than UA. That is exactly the split boxes of figure one. The symmetry that is observed in the SCT is not an accident. It is precisely the symmetry one would expect if the SCT was optimized to avoid translation errors. In particular, the failed rejection errors due to unmodified pyrimidines in the wobble position. And there's the A, and there's the U with either U or A, and there's the G with either U or A. Itzkowitz and Lalonde in 2007 described a third remarkable orthogonal advantage of the SCT, the assignments of UAA, UAG, and UGA as stop codons. High frequency codons, such as those causing for aspartic and glutamic acid, apparently there's a lot of that in most proteins, can frequently form stop codons if the reading frame shifts. So you move the, uh, you put an extra one and you start going off frame. Consequently, translation of a frame shift error is halted more quickly on average in the real genetic code than in 99.3% of alternate codes. It is optimized for this to 99 plus percent, or 1 in 140, uh, uh, over 1 in 140, thus saving the cell significant expense. Correlated with this advantage is the SCT's nearly optimal ability to contain secondary signal sequences within the protein coding sequence. For example, those that encode regulatory and structural protein binding and splicing sites. And I might add also the uh, overlapping protein codes as far as that goes. Now, that means those advantages are not orthogonal, they're related to each other. The reason for the correlation between these two advantages is quite simple. Secondary signal sequences are likely to obtain, are likely to contain all trinucleotide combinations, including UAA, UAG, or UGA. But if any of these combinations appear as in-frame codons in the protein coding sequence, they will be read as stop codons during translation. However, since as noted above, UAA, UAG, and UGA are frame shifts of common codons, it is more probable that they can be successfully embedded in protein coding sequences. That is, you can have a stop codon in one reading frame while you're having the regular codons in another reading frame which means you can have two codes going on at the same time and stop one in the middle without stopping the other one. In other words, the first advantage of the SCT, translation of frame sequence uh, stops sooner, leads to the second advantage. Secondary signals are embedded more successfully and vice versa. Again, those are not orthogonal, they're related. The fourth orthogonal feature of the SCT is its use of methionine as an initiating amino acid. In 2011, Lim, Curran, and Garber devised a novel theory explaining interactions between biomolecules in solution. The lowest barrier to interaction results from hydrophobic molecules that present one another with the smallest surface area. A quick inspection of figure four shows that lysine and methionine are the longest unbranched amino acid residues. Of these two, only methionine is also hydrophobic. Indeed, when Lim et al. calculated which residue had the lowest interaction barrier, methionine was, was by far the most optimal. And of course, it's the one that's used first. Besides these four orthogonal features summarized in table one, there are additional SCT features that appear to be orthogonally optimized. Three that will be given here as examples. First, the SCT uses fewer codons for rarer and more energetically costly amino acids, such as tryptophan, for example thus conserving cellular resources, particularly in mitochondria. 
Second, it has been shown that the frame shifts of the coding and non-coding strands of genes, that is, protein coding DNA, are more likely to translate into folded proteins than frame shifts of non-genes. It makes it easier to have overlapping codes. In other words, the SCT facilitates the encoding of several proteins in a single region of DNA up to a maximum of six, three in one strand and three in the complementary strand. This high compression of protein data, which we went over a few uh, weeks ago, um, occurs naturally in some viruses that, due to the small volume of their capsids, must encode their protein data in their DNA genome as efficiently as possible. It also occurs in bacteria and in humans. Third, the SCT ensured that more common amino acids are less prone to change due to a single base mutation relative to less common ones. This keeps the total number of amino acids changes lower. Interestingly, alternate codon tables that ensure this effect on both strands of the DNA are extremely rare. And again, the SCT is one in a million in this respect. These three additional features are reminders that there are undoubtedly more optimal aspects of the SCT that are waiting discovery. In the next section, two theories for the origin of optimality in the SCT will be compared. The first theory depends on the adaptive selection of earlier codes. The second theory depends on the influence of external intelligence. These theories will be evaluated based on whether they plausibly explain the origin of the SCT's optimality in the absence of metaphysical biases. They will also be evaluated based on whether they are conductive, uh, conducive to further discoveries of the SCT features. The origin of optimality in the standard codon table. The first section of this paper outlined the four theories of the origin of the SCT, frozen accident, error minimization, biosynthesis, and stereochemistry. The second section examined ortho orthogonally optimal features of the code without specifying models for their origin. In this section, origins are again discussed, but only the origin and optimality of the SCT is considered. Since frozen accident, biosynthesis, and stereochemistry are not optimizing mechanisms, you just take whatever you find for a frozen accident, and um, produce optimal features only as a collateral effect, they will not be discussed in the section. Rather, the error minimization theory will be examined in more detail and compared to the hypothesis that an external intelligence is responsible for the observed optimal features. Table one lists four orthogonally optimal features, which I'm go not gonna go over. Um, we've discussed them. Um, they're in the paper if you wanna go into more detail. And the extent of optimization in the SCT due to each one. At first glance, it may seem that one feature, error impact minimization, completely determines any and all optimizations in the SCT since the error impact criterion alone, the, using the error impact criterion alone, the SCT was shown to be the most optimal of all possible codes. <coughs> However, there are three important restrictions placed on the possible codes to which the SCT is compared. First, these other codes must match the SCT in terms of synonymous codons. That is, the other codes will have the same gray and black boxes figure in, in figure one, but with different amino acids in each box, because otherwise you can't error minimize. Second, the other codes must match the SCT in terms of their stop codons. They must all use UAA, UAG, and UGA as stop codons. Third, to construct an alternate code, amino acids cannot swap their positions in one with all others, but only biosynthetically related ones. The four groups of related amino acids are phenylalanine, serine, tyrosine, and cytosine, uh, uh, cysteine, and tryptophan. Two, leucine, proline, histine, glycine, and, uh, pardon me, glutamine, and arginine. Three, isoleucine, methionine, tyrosine, uh, you know, tyrosine, uh, asparagine, and lysine, and four, valine, alanine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and glycine, because those are biochemically related. The SCT is the best of all possible codes within a specific subset of possible codes. If one of the three restrictions is relaxed, the SCT is no longer the best of all. For example, the prior work of Freeland et al. did not include the third restriction, that is, that one must on, uh, only swap biosynthetically related amino acids 
As a result, they found one alternative codon tab um, table out of a million attempts that outperformed the SCT in terms of error impact minimization. That's still pretty impressive. Uh, code is one in a million. Interestingly, the other two restrictions are at least partially set by optimal features discussed earlier. Error occurrence minimization partially sets the first rest restriction, matching synonymously code and boxes. And secondary signal maximization roughly sets the second restriction, UAA and UAG and UAGA stop codons. With two of those three restrictions in place to first approximation, the SCT, SCT appears to be at least a one in a million code. The question at this point is, what is the mechanism for the SCT's optimization? How do we get a one in a million code? It is useful to consider three hypotheses, law, chance, and intelligence. This is standard Dembski explanatory filter. In other words, is the organization best explained by a predictable law-like process, by random chance, or by intelligent causation? To distinguish between these three choices, it's useful to evalu evaluate them sequentially, beginning with law-like processes. If no law-like process explains the effect, the probability that chance processes should be, should be considered. I, that's a, I, I think the probability of chance explaining the processes should be considered or something like that. Finally, if chance is ruled out based on low probabilities relative to the available time and opportunities, then intelligent causa is causation is by default the best explanation for the effect. Is there a law? that can explain the SCT optimization. Several papers have considered this possibility. For example, if there were primordial organisms that all use different codon tables, and if these organisms competed, such as the only, only the most fit lineage survived, then by the law-like process of natural selection, this lineage would become the last universal common ancestor, and its codon table would become the standard for all life. It took over the, the, the field. Wait a minute. Primordial organisms that all use different codon tables, so there have to be a million different organisms. We're not talking about life originating once now. We're talking right about life spontaneously originating a million times, or at least adopting a code a million times. Okay. <laughs> how, yes. How are these organisms going to survive if they don't have a code uh, uh, because they had because they I start mean, out as RNA organisms that doesn't help at all uh, well we'll we'll go into you're that gonna, actually you're gonna, have, you're gonna have to have a code there yes but it's a different kind of code but why should the two codes match each other or, mm -hmm. or why yeah why should they why should RNA life that's, dev that's uh, evolved to uh, a high extent so that the code is good for <coughs> RNA life, why should that be translated over into good for protein life is totally beyond me and mm -hmm. I think totally beyond everybody else too. How can you change a code from one to another and have su survival value uh, in both cases? I, I, I don't follow well, that. Well, that's the reason why they don't think that this would have happened as one code evolved into another because it's too hard to evolve. So it had to have a, a di a different origins and then just the bad ones died out. So you're going to have uh, several uh, frozen accidents? You're going to have several frozen accidents, the worst of which kind of got left by the wayside. It's okay. Well, you're I mean, allowed to be skeptical. Well, I'm skeptical too. I mean, they won't even accept one frozen accident, most of them. Why in the world are you, where are you going here? <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad I don't have to argue that side. Competition between separate lineages with different codes is deemed more likely than a changing code over time within a lineage where each changed each change code would need to be backward compatible to the genetic messages of the previous code. Yet despite being more likely, this is a question, you know, could this have evolved? No. So it had to have a, a million different in order to probably gather, or either that or we got very lucky. 
You know, there's some people that uh, should be trying their hand at the lottery because they obviously. Do you change the code on any one organism? He's dead. Uh, of course, of course. So they have to originate spontaneously, separately. Well, you're back to frozen accidents. That's right, that's right. And may the best frozen accident win. <laughs> Yet despite being more likely, many publications have argued that the law of competition be between lineages cannot explain the SCT's optimization. So these guys are on your side, 6, 10, 16, 26 through 30. The problem is that if SCT is one in a million, there must be a million competing genetic codes in the population of primordial organisms. Where do they come from? This problem becomes worse when the, optimation of the uh, optimization of the SCT approaches the best of all possible codes. In that case, a population of competing codes would need to approach 10 to the 84th. A, a ludicrous population size, considering that 10 to the 84th carbon atoms are a trillion, trillion, trillion times more massive than the Earth. Not to mention 10 to the 84th bacteria. Not to mention more atoms than you have in the universe. Well, you know, at this point, obviously, we are, we are reaching for straws. So is chance then a reasonable explanation for the SCT's optimization? In 2007, Eugene Koonin invoked the chance hypothesis. You guys should read this. You really should. Uh, maybe I'll bring it as a separate presentation sometime. It is that good. To explain the complexity of a translation replication system, which would include the SCT translation components such as shown in figure two, and a host of other translation and replication machines. How could a chance occurrence possibly explain even more complexity and optimization than the SCT alone? Kuhn's answer is that if our universe is one of many in an infinite multiverse, emergence of highly complex systems by chance is inevitable. So you just basically, you keep playing the lottery until you win. He has left science there. But Kunin was criticized by Eric Baptiste in open access reviewer's comments that accompanied this paper for using a metaphysical argument that, quote, could open a huge door to the tenets of intelligent design. I think that's supposed to be tenets. Um, forgive Baptiste, he's French. Um, an appeal to an infinite multiverse which has never been nor can ever be observed is a poor way to rescue the chance hypothesis from overwhelmingly low probabilities. Better to rule out the chance hypothesis and proceed to the next hypothesis for even if the particular intelligence responsible for a low probability effect is not known, the general pattern of intelligence producing finely tuned optimized effects is well known and well studied. Design is not controversial, but a designer is. Uh, what I'll point out is that because a designer is controversial, design has become controversial, which uh, was the part of my presentation a couple of weeks ago, where design is obvious, but there were people arguing against it because they knew where this was going. All scientists uh, admit that aspects of the universe, and biological systems in particular, conform to various designs that achieve various functions. Remember the apparent design of of, of Richard Dawkins. Yet most scientists reject the possibility that an external intelligence, that is a designer, is responsible for the observed design. Natural selection is a designer substitute. It enabled us to become intellectually fulfilled atheists. There is a persistent pervasive bias against the design hypothesis which ensures that even if law and chance fail to explain a biological effect, for example, the optimization of SCT. External intelligence will never be considered as an option. However, once this bias is removed, the external intelligence hypothesis becomes the best working hypothesis. They know that. That's why they don't want to go there. Therefore, it should not be considered the most viable explanation until a natural, therefore it should be considered the most viable explanation until a natural me mechanism can be found that explains the degree of SCT optimization and all the other stuff that they have to explain. 
or until new data show that the current assessment of optimization is grossly overestimated. A lingering question is, why is this bias against external intelligence? Possibly scientists worry that explaining some natural effects via an intelligent force will encourage all effects to be explained in this way, therefore dooming the scientific method. This is a reasonable concern. The final section of this paper, therefore, examines the benefits of using external intelligence as a working hypothesis in the specific case of SCT optimization. First, the history. Using the hypothesis of external intelligence to, dis uh, to guide discovery. Before the discovery of the SCT in the early 1960s, many researchers assumed that the code would be optimal in some respect. For example, the Diamond Code uh, proposed by George Gamow in 1954 was optimal in its information storage, but not in its flexibility. A chain of N amino acids could be coded by a chain of N plus 2 mRNA letters. Whereas in the real SCT, N amino acids are specified by 3N mRNA letters. But that means that you can code whatever you want instead of only being restricted to certain uh, codes at the end. Another pre-SCT code proposed by Crick, or Griffin, and Orgel in 1957 was comma-free and optimal for avoiding frame shifts. If you had a frame shift, it turned into just nothing. Still other codes had interesting mechanisms for automatically correcting errors in translation. So it depends on what optimality is. With the discovery of the real SCT, and we're showing, going to show you figures four and five in just a minute, uh, two features were immediately recognized. The SCT lacked the host of nonsense codons that were required in the comma-free codes, and the SCT assigned similar codons to similar amino acids. The first feature implied that the physical machinery of the genetic code had to be vastly more complex, or more of a random accident, than had originally, uh, than originally envisioned. Here's the figure four, and in a minute we'll have figure five. This is just another way of, of, of looking at it. And each, each the, the big square is divided into U, A, G and C. The next squares are divided into um, UA, uh, UU, UA, UG, and UC. And then the, the third one is inside of the little ones. And you can see um, they put the side chains on the amino acids. Um, and with this uh, in figure five, this is the family split box symmetry that we've seen in figure one, just drawn in a little different way. And um, you, you notice that this has the, the ones where the third uh, codon all, uh, doesn't matter, they all match. And these are the ones where you split the box, phenylalanine and leucine in this particular area. Um, you'll notice that there's still arginine, arginine, and there's still serine, serine. Now isoleucine has turned into a, something that surrounds methionine, and uh, tryptophan is still all by itself. And then this is the same thing, but just drawn a little bit differently. The red is hydrophobic, and the blue and violet are hydrophilic. And you'll notice that they're in the same general areas of the codon, uh, of the codon table. The second feature, similar codons for similar uh, amino acids, revealed a new type of optimization that was not anticipated and surprisingly was not readily accepted as an optimization. The majority of publications for 30 years seemed intent on explaining away this optimization and interpreting the lack of nonsense codons as evidence of randomness rather than complexity of the biosynthetic SCT origin theory by, uh, via codon expansion, also called codon capture, where biosynthetically related amino acids capture the codons for amino acids that are all be already being used in the SCT. In this theory, physical chemical similarities and biosynthetic pathways, in particular biosynthetic pathways, determine how similar codons were assigned to groups of amino acids. And it kind of works, but not really. Would the SCT research have taken a different tack if external intelligence was considered as its possible source? Would we have been looking at how neat is this design? 
would we have discovered the one in a million or the best possible code uh, earlier? Would it have taken over 30 years to demonstrate that the obvious pattern of similar amino acids and similar codons confers an impressive level of error impact minimization? Let me see if I can go back and point out. You see, if you make an error here, instead of getting leucine, you get valine. But leucine and valine are very closely related, as is isoleucine to valine is even more closely related. So, you know, you're looking at, you're looking at uh, biochemical similarities that are, are actually useful. Would other features, secondary signal encoding and error occurrence minimization, have been discovered earlier? That's the back look. At least two papers in the late 1960s suggested that the observed pattern was real optimization and not an artifact of biosynthesis or codon expansion. However, only one of these took an experimental approach and actually tested the SCT against other possible codes, showing that it was more optimal than a random code. This study from 1969 was only cited three times in the 1970s, but gained citations as interest in the optimization of the SCT grew in late 1980s and into the 1990s. By the time Freeland and Hearst published their one in a million paper in 1998, discussion of error impact minimizations in the SCT was in full swing. It is impossible to state unequivocally that optimized features in the SCT would have been discovered and discussed more rapidly in the absence of a bias against external intelligence. However, it is instructive to look at an example from archaeology, where external in intelligence, that is human intelligence, is assumed to account for many features. The Rosetta Stone's discovery in 1799 sparked widespread global interest. Copies were circulated to museums, and each new observation that uh, brought scholars closer to cracking the hieroglyphs was heralded across Europe. In other words, there's a lot of noise about it. On the other hand, contrast with this scene with the discovery of the SCT. Certainly there was widespread interest, though perhaps shorter lived. An artip article published three years after the SCT's discovery bore the title, The Genetic Code after the excitement. Uh, three years later, the excitement is pretty well gone. The main difference was that the features of the SCT that we now know to be highly optimized were noticed immediately, but explained away. Would the discovery today of an intergalactic Rosetta Stone with the potential to decipher an extraterrestrial language be explained away as an artifact? Certainly not. The bias for or against external intelligence makes all the difference. If you believe there's intelligence, you look for signs of intelligence. You don't believe there's intelligence, yeah, it could be intelligence. <coughs> there are more features of the SCT that merit examination. Does the proximity in the SCT of biosynthetically related amino acids merely reflect its historical evolution, or could this too be an optimized feature? Is it significant that the SCT's stop codons would have the weakest codon codon inter interactions? These and other features will surely be investigated, but the speed at which they will be studied would accelerate if researchers considered the SCT a possible product of external intelligence with optimized, carefully engineered features awaiting discovery. Conclusion. The SCT is by no means the most complex piece of the biological world. On the contrary, its relative simplicity is the reason it's been examined in this paper. Since it is an arrangement of 20 amino acids and the signal for stop uh, polymerizing uh, amino acids with known properties onto 64 trinucleotides with known properties, it is an ideal test case to examine orthogonal optimized features and to apply the filter of law, chance, and intelligence. If the optimization of the SCT lies between one in a million and the best of all possible codes, as is likely to be the case, the law and chance hypothesis are increasingly untenable and external intelligence becomes the most promising working hypothesis. As new orthogonally op optimized features are discovered, the explanatory divide between law and chance on the one hand and intelligence on the other becomes more pronounced. Now, my take, there is one more point I would make and that is methionine starts proteins and is only given one codon which means that it it makes it less likely that proteins will start where they're not supposed to. And it has three different bases, which means, again, you know, if you have a poly A or a poly U or a poly G or a poly C, <laughs> that this is not likely where you're going to start. Um, it's going to have to have a very specific um, uh, sequence there. 
it's harder to start protein forming accidentally <coughs> using that particular uh, point. I think this is a very good paper. I think that the design argument is good. The criticism of Kunin is good. The research survey and the proposal are good. Um, the Kunin paper deserves its own com evaluation. But again, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. There is one amino acid that is encoded that is the 21st amino acid. It's called selenocysteine. It uses selenium instead of sulfur. And it is actually encoded by one of the stop codons. How do you do that? Um, there is a specific transfer RNA that employs that particular stop codon. And now that you've mentioned that the stop codons are weakly um, binding, uh, you can see that they're kind of almost uh, waiting to see if something binds them. But there is only one of the three possible stop, or what is it, four in one box plus one on the side. One of those is the only one that's used in that way. Uh, not many proteins contain selenocysteine. Mm -hmm. Probably fewer than contain tryptophan. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, I would just say, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, optimization is used by the evolutionists as evidence of evolution and optimization is used by the creationists as evidence of creation. Well, uh, non-optimization uh, is also used by evolution as ev evidence for evolution. In fact, uh, when they thought mm. that this could be explained as a frozen accident, um, they actually kind of liked that because it meant that, you know, we're just here for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But a, a frozen accident seems so unlikely. What well, we, we just happened <coughs> upon the best of all possible codes. Yeah, but uh, otherwise, <laughs> come back to what I was saying earlier, how are you going to get or change codes in organisms as they evolve? I, I don't see this as possible. Well, they agree. They agree. And in fact, um, <coughs> interestingly, Dawkins has used, uh, among other people, um, this very argument to say that all organisms must have been related by evolution because they have the same code. Yes. Otherwise, they would have used different codes. Um, I assume that that means the paramecium <coughs> really came from Alpha Centauri or something because it has a different code. And, and the mitochondria must have <coughs> come from uh, um, Sirius, maybe. Well, that, uh, but uh, you, you, the uh, counter to that is, he, is saying, well, you expect God to have created different codes in different organisms. That makes no sense. Well, especially if the code we have is optimal. <coughs> why should he, why should he deliberately use suboptimal codes? <coughs> It would be interesting to know how the paramecium code compares with the other codes. And what would be even more interesting, whatever that's for, uh, what would be even more interesting is to find out whether there are certain features of the paramecium uh, that make it so that it, um, uh, so that its code is optimal for it, even though it's not optimal for most other organisms. And I don't know the answer to that. But, you know, that's an, that, is a, that is a question that intelligent design suggests we ought to be asking. And, you know, I think that uh, Makosko and um, Smeltzer are right. I think that, um, that looking at it as the possible, you know, that, that the God created this specifically with the intention 
of making organisms' genetic codes tough. You know, maybe in the case of paramecium, there is a certain advantage to having a slightly different code. Interestingly, it's not a totally different code for either the paramecium or the um, mitochondria. But there have been a few codes that have popped up, and as you say, so we've kind of stolen one of the um, um, stop codons for ac acetylcysteine, which, or not, in, for selenocysteine, which is basically cysteine, but instead of having a sulfur, it has a selenium. The it's only thing, one of the three stop codons. Yes, only one of them is used that way. Um, now, this... Um, you don't happen to know which one. Uh, I, have, I can send you the paper describing this uh, right off the top of my head right now. So it's, uh, UAG, UGA, UAA. It would be interesting if it was UAA. That's why I'm asking. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry. I have yeah. to look that up. Um, in the meantime, it, it strikes me that the very fact that you have a degenerate coding system, as it is sometimes referred to, uh, or rather this, this redundancy in the coding system, um, it opens up the opportunity for different organisms optimizing their own codon usage for their own purposes. Thus, you can have different dialects being spoken in different organisms. So that instead of leucine being always one uh, or, or being randomly spread out in, in the various proteins, that this particular bacterium likes to use one particular coding for leucine. Right. Uh, or, yes. And, and for, for example, you uh, will We saw that last week. You, you, yeah, you will find that bacteria tend to favor certain codons for the same amino acids versus eukaryotes versus, say, fungi and such, you can actually look at the total spread of the different dialects, and they come in particular groupings. So Which you means that... You can identify where the sequence came mm -hmm. from simply from the dialect that's spoken. Right. Well, without further comment, we will uh, we will uh, uh, I guess leave this subject alone. Next week, uh, we hope that uh, we'll have something worthwhile and interesting to uh, to uh, uh, to talk about. I, I think if there was one thing I would want to leave us with, it is the idea that uh, when people say God, God don't make no junk, at least in this the standard coding table, we can pretty much prove that. 